Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Self Care is the New Healthcare podcast. Hello. And this is going to be part of our um, obesity and weight related issue series. And uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, diets and how there is uh, really the myth of the perfect the diet. myth of the perfect diet the the myth of the one size fits all diet there are no magic diets right um, and so we're going to go through the more common diets that are out there um, the, the, going through the good the bad and the ugly mm-hmm. with them and kind of helping you understand more about how uh, diet relates uh, to you and perhaps your weight struggles and maybe help you find the right diet yeah, and, and and we want to help you find you know that that perfect diet for you okay but first we have to listen to our intro hellroys yes i don't take nothing that a doctor don't prescribe i don't do no drugs man i don't do no drugs man All right, so um, let me get through this little thing that I always have to read before we get started. This content is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not intended to provide medical advice or to take the place of medical advice or treatment from a personal physician. And I'm not your preso- your personal physician. Nope. Not yet, anyway. So to, to prepare for this, I've been following a lot of different uh, diet forums um, on Twitter, but other forums. Do I have a smoothie on my face? No, do I? Uh-uh. I usually have purple in my... Okay. Sorry. I don't... Right. Talk about perfect diet. <laughs> but I've been following these um, different forums to learn. One thing I, the one thing they have all in common is they're super passionate about what they do. You cannot point out any type of flaw without just getting trolled mercilessly. Mm-hmm. And um, which is great that they... Because you interact with these people on Twitter. I just stopped doing that a long time ago. Well, I, I'm going to stop all this. This is just for the purpose of researching this. And then I would follow up doing other research, not just Twitter, but I wanted to find out what the pulse was and, and why there's so much passion on completely opposite ends of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. So let's just walk through some of the more common ones, give the, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it. And then, you know, we're trying to get you to think about how you will formulate your perfect diet. And, and diet is just one part of the um, obesity issue. Um, everybody wants to focus on food like that's the only thing that matters when it comes to um, obesity and weight loss. The, yes, it's a big deal. What you what you consume, the foods you consume are, are very important with regard to uh, your weight issues. But there are many, many other things that we have to consider as well. And we'll be talking about those in future um, episodes. Well, that's where a lot of the passion comes from these different diet forums is they've had anecdotal success, whether mm-hmm. it be weight loss or if they're, um, you know, ultras, um, UC, IBS, things like that, that is cleared up, uh, Crohn's disease, and they're, they're having success with them. But those aren't weight issues. The, that's what's making them so passionate about it. It's still, you know, when you think about perfect diet, it's not all about weight. It's, it's about health. Right. So we need to incorporate that. It's, yes, this is about obesity and weight loss, but it's also about finding the perfect diet for health, which often go hand in hand well and obesity is just a, it's a symptom of uh, immune dysregulation uh, which then causes metabolic derangements and, and systemic inflammation is a part of that and most of our chronic diseases fall into that category as well it's just how um, your genetics express the inflammation that you encounter in your body some people get fat some people don't mm-hmm. uh, a lot of people do though and they also develop a lot of inflammatory conditions that go along with that Let's start with one that we use um, in your practice, is which is the keto diet. Um, mm-hmm. You've prescribed this to certain people yeah. for certain conditions. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, for people who have metabolic syndrome or severe metabolic um, disease, where you know they have they're obese or you know uh, overweight, high blood pressure, they may be pre-diabetic or diabetic and have cardiovascular disease. You know, these are all <laughs> inflammatory conditions. I'm not sure why the mainstream medical community won't recognize that as such, but um, they respond very well to um, a ketogenic diet. Um, even when, you know, because there's a reduction um, in 
carbohydrate content. Um, and so even when those people limit their carbs, they still don't get the benefit as if they were to go into ketosis mm-hmm. a lot of times. And so I have used that on those people to get their um, inflammation levels down, their blood sugars under control, and start getting some of this weight off. But that is not that diet is not for everyone. Not everybody can do that. Well, and also, some people just do not respond well. Some people do. It works great for them. They they get off their insulin and, and their medications, and they drop weight and they feel great. Um, but long term, from the research that we have access to now, mm-hmm. um, long term it can cause you know some um, some hormone imbalances and some GI microbial changes that are not so good if you were to do it long term. And that's why we kind of pulse hours with our patients. Mm -hmm. We use it initially to get the weight off and get these metabolic derangements under control. And then we might transition them to, um, you know, more of a Mediterranean style diet where they're still kind of, you know, limiting their uh, their simple carbs and, and, and things like that. Um, but again, it's, uh, when we work with patients, we're trying to, you know, a Mediterranean diet might not be for everybody. We're trying to find which, you know, what, what foods, what style of eating is going to be best for you in your particular lifestyle and environmental exposures. And what, one thing you just hit upon that I think is going to be important for all these diets that we talk about, that it was successful because it was an intervention mm-hmm. and that intervention could mimic our our ancestry, how we evolved. There could be times in our evolutionary past that we went for extended periods of time on just fat. Mm-hmm. or mostly. Whatever was accessible. Right. So I always try to look back as what is the historical precedent? You know, 500 years back, 1,000 years back, 10,000 years back, 100,000 years back. And, and does it fit any of those criteria? And if it does, then I, I bring it to more validity. So I, that's why I think the, ketos, the ketogenic diet has merit because it mimics short-term interventions that we might have had in the past and short-term could be three months six months so and and ketogenic diets you have to know what you're doing to do them correctly um there's a lot of little things that you have to consider Mm -hmm. when you're starting people on those types of diets um and and we also use them you know for people who might have seizure disorder that's another um uh, diet that's it's it's a great for people who have seizures and epilepsy Probably the, the biggest mistake that people make is that they think they can eat anything that's fatty, and so they're getting... Well, they don't... Everybody wants to... No one focuses on the quality of your food. Right. So, ba- folks, bacon is not... Is it technically allowed on the keto diet? Sure. Yeah. But that's not going to make you healthy. Yeah. When I was um, working at a hospital in Little Rock, I'd go over to the cafeteria, and this is when, you know, keto was... Boy, it, it was coming out hard. Everybody was jumping on the keto bandwagon, and I would see what they were putting on their plate... And I could tell that they were doing keto, but it was, it was some of the poorest quality stuff you could imagine on their plates, Mm -hmm. but they were keto, right? you know, so it was this sausage and bacon and, um, hamburgers and all kinds of, um, just poor quality meats. Well, and and with too much protein, you can also offset, you can derail your, your ketogenic process because uh, through um Ke- uh, glu- glucone- gluconeogenesis correct <laughs> um which you know your body needs glucose so if you don't have it readily available it's going to create it right through, and it's either going to do it from protein you've ingested or protein you have on your or body you're, or you're breaking down your fat stores yeah, yeah. so um well the, you know the, if you need glucose it's going to go that way right so that's one of the big mistakes there. So a lot of people now are talking about the carnivore or the lion diet. Well, not a lot of people, just the crazy people that you have somehow found well, on it, it, Twitter. It, it's very interesting because it does have merit. Mm-hmm. I, At least, I mean, we don't have that much information on this. It hasn't been done that long. Now, it appears that the longest I've found someone was in that five-year range. But again, to what level was it strict? And I mean, these are anonymous people on Twitter. You have no idea right. if they're lying. Yeah. You know. But the the one thing I do think that it has again merit. One, there are times in our in our evolutionary past that we probably did subsist off of just meat. You know, I can see that occurring. Um, yeah, if you came up on a herd of bison or something, you're like, hey. Or, All right, let's. Or, or if you're living off of dried meats, yeah. So th- I, I can see how it occurred. Um, 
it uniquely creates an elemental diet. Now, explain what an elemental diet is. Well, uh, so um, an elemental diet is just, it's a diet that, um, where your food is broken down into, you know, very abs- digestible, absorbable forms. So you're, it, it really um, kind of bypasses the digestive action of your GI tract in an attempt to just to give it a rest and help you your body absorb these nutrients better. It's mainly a, like an amino acid cocktail. Yes, with you know, it's it's got the the basic building blocks there: your amino acids, your fatty acids, and um, your simple carbs. Things that can be easily absorbed in the GI tracts so of people who are having a lot of problems with their GI tracts mm-hmm. and those, you know, people with IV, uh, uh, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's and those things, when they have these flares, they really have a problem, you know, uh, with food and digesting it and absorbing it. So you, you, you put them on, you know, elemental diets. They're very strict. They're very boring, very bland, but it can kind of calm down some of that inflammation. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're not always successful. And I've tried to use these on some people with, with some limited you know, success. Well, it appears that the carnivore diet mimics that in some fashion where it is basic enough. I mean, you're eliminating all food groups. So yeah. you, you, you've, if there, if plants were an antagonist to you, you've eliminated them. Mm-hmm. We know carbs can be antagonistic, so you've eliminated them. And technically you can get all your nutrients. If you eat the liver raw, you can get your vitamin C. There's some other organ meats you have to eat um, raw. And then there's and, raw, and then and you're supposed to cook, you know, in just tallow, lard, and salt. So to me, it sounds boring. But I also see them talking about, you know, sausage and bacon and falling back into that trap. Again, nobody's thinking about quality. Very few of the forums are talking about is it grass fed. Mm-hmm. And so I started thinking. You and I were talking. Age free. Well, you and I were talking last night, and I thought it was interesting. Is like, well, what would make the carnivore diet pass, you know, our 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 smell test as far as they're getting all the nutrients? Because we know. In plants, there are many uh, flavonoids and um, phytonutrients that are very valuable to us, yet um, those are not in the meats. So how can something in a plant have such a benefit to us? And um, that includes all the different medicines. Right. So I started thinking, well, what if you, you know, if we always say you are what you eat, eats. So these people are mainly eating livestock animals who are fed corn. They are eating GMO corn. GMO corn. Even if they're eating grass-fed beef, they're only eating what a ruminant eats, mainly grasses, a few forbs, and a few... Um, Tell them what a ruminant is. A ruminant is a multi-chambered stomach okay. grazing animal, as opposed to us. We have a single... You don't typically hear that word. That's why I wanted you to... Mr. Nerd, you well, need to speak in layman's terms. So if you were going to give any validity to the carnivore diet... And they do eat fish and other things. I think you'd have to get super crazy about what you eat because you need to eat lots of different birds that eat different berries. You need to eat... You need to eat a variety of animals. Yes, monkeys. And they, they kind of talk about that, but it's all livestock animals that are still... You know, their big thing is we're going back to the way we used to do it, yet they're... These animals are not... They have evolved as well. Well, it's the same Neolithic... that they, they find fault in the Neolithic... <laughs> food chain, right. yet everything they're eating is part of the Neolithic exactly. food chain. You know, chickens, hogs. All right. I just don't want to give any more attention to these people. Well, I want to, they're a little I, bit crazy. Well, no, but it does have some validity. And it's <clears> for <throat> people to understand the complexity to it. The opposite in the spectrum. Are the vegans. And I'll give the nod to the carnivores before I will the vegans, because we've had more experience with Yeah, I've vegans. dealt with I've dealt with a lot of vegans. Um not going to lie, vegans are some of my sickest patients. Mm-hmm. They have um, a lot of nutrient deficiencies. They don't detox well. Um, vegan, if you do not do a vegan, you have to be extremely on it to to do well on a vegan diet. Right. And most people don't. They just think if so long as they're eliminating animal proteins, then they can just eat whatever. And I see their posts on social media, and, you know, they're eating donuts and and just all kinds of crap but hey they're vegan and they think they're being healthy and i see and i see people fall into this trap who are wanting to lose weight and now you know all, the rage now is all you know pr- plant-based diets and vegetarianism that's the way to go you know and um and so i see people who just fall fall for that and then again they're not focusing on the quality of their foods and they're eating tons of carbs 
because it's not animals, Mm -hmm. but they're eating a lot of carbs and a lot of poor quality carbs and poor quality fats and lots of sugar and um, going to the doctor all the time because I see those posts too. But hey, they're a vegan. Well, and and a lot of that crowd also is the um, save the planet and animal you know, cruelty issues. Right. Which I'm, you know, the the animal cruelty thing is a big one for me. I think the way we raise our animals to slaughter is, is a very inhumane and, and I don't like it. As opposed to how we slaughter our own animals. Right. When, when I do it, it's. Yeah. You're very good about that. I mean, their last moment is happy Mm -hmm. until I shoot them, (laughs) but they're not, they're not being transported and stressed and hearing, you know, watching their friends being shot. It's at least as humane as can be possible. But I can say this as a regenerative farmer, that you absolutely need livestock in order to do regenerative farming. There is a lot of land that is not suitable for agriculture right. other than grazing. Mm-hmm. It is one of the best ways to sequester carbon. I can it take too much time to explain the methane loop to them, but you know there's fallacies in the whole uh, that the methane is is from the from the cattle is the issue. But to restore land and to keep land healthy. It evolved with animals. I mean, the best example I use is the bison. There was, you know, herds of 20 million that came up and down the plains twice a year. Mm-hmm. So they would graze it down. It got rid of the old growth. They they'd they'd poop, poop all over they'd the poop, place. They poop it, and then they'd let it grow back up, and then they'd come back. Mm-hmm. That's the ideal way. That's why the Midwest had three to five feet of topsoil because that had happened for mm-hmm. hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, and now we're down to less than a meter of, of topsoil and we're, you know, it's, it's going away because of our intensive growing. I also want to point out when we do row crops, I guess you have to rack and stack which animals are all animals equal, but some are more equal than others. <laughs> As Animal Farm said, because there are lots of mice and voles and rabbits that are destroyed with row crops. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah. we're, and we're obliterating our bees with that way. That's, because a, that's a big... Big issue. And the people want to talk about, well, we'll go organic. It is tough to do organic row crops the way we Especially do Especially in the South. Yes. With well, all the bugs. And, the, and the, just the way we do things. It'd be a complete change, and the price change would be shocking. I'm all for it. But I just want to point out these reasons to be vegan are not good reasons. But it, it's not a healthy diet. It's difficult to get what you need. You're not saving the planet. Um, the animal cruelty is an issue, but that can be resolved without going vegan. Because, I mean, to, to grow all of these plants that you need to feed the population, you're going to be cutting down a lot more trees. We were, we were down in Helena, where you're from, which is down the Delta. Um, you know, they shoot thousands of snow geese per field to keep them from eating the seeds. They have permits. It's legal. I know. So, again... Plant does not equate to not eating an animal or killing an animal. There's just a lot, a lot of things to consider um, when you start talking about land management. The whole, the I guess the um, what am I trying to say? The um, the production of all of these plants. Mm-hmm. The food system's complicated. The food system is very, very complicated. Lots of things to consider. And if you've never farmed and you don't even, you have no business talking about it. Right. And that's why we're going to do a lot of episodes. But everybody likes to jump on the feel good bandwagon. It's all about our feels, you know, well, and some of emotions your... are, it seems like emotions are basically dictating everything today. And logic has just gone out the window. Well, an agenda. I mean, some of your counterparts yeah, in I functional know. medicine who have never had a callus on their hand, have never gotten dirt. I mean, I love the, the Michael Bloomberg how, how he exposed live in New York City and gonna tell him gonna talk to me about farming well he said you know farming's easy you just plant the seed and it's like, it just comes up what an idiot what yeah. a and this is you know these are our leader he was trying to be president so it, it's and people in the functional medicine world trying to talk about regenerative farming who have never done it so we'll talk about it because I have done it and been successful um, let's go back midstream then let's talk about paleo okay because that was the big one before keto and right paleo is big and it's and i know a lot of people that do great on paleo Mm -hmm. um and so i don't want to you know that's great if you do wonderful on paleo paleo tends to eliminate the beans and uh, beans and grains um, nuts and dairy Mm -hmm. those are the big groups for the paleo people um and my only concern is that don't throw them out unless you truly have an issue with them 
And I think a lot of the things that why people can't tolerate some of the beans and legumes, not everybody, but some is because, you know, they're not, um, they're not prepared correctly to get rid of the offensive parts of those foods. And you do a good job when you make beans for us, Mm -hmm. prepare them correctly to get rid of the offending agents. Right. So the, the other, their argument is, oh, we, you know, it has the phytic acid and the lectins and these are bad for you and therefore I'm going to get rid of them. But they're ignoring, it's just the last hundred years that we got lazy. You know, before then we always had sourdough bread. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's even in the Bible with Ezekiel. Ferment, fermentation was, is a huge part of our food preparation techniques as far as historically speaking. And we don't do that anymore. Well, I mean, Ezekiel in the Bible said, you know, take grains and legumes and put them in a vessel and let them ferment and make right. bread. They, that was good advice because the fermentation, the soaking, combining different grains, because some of them have phytase, which is what deactivates the phytic acid, are combined. Um, the soaking process, the fermentation process, um, pressure cooking, cooking, these are all things that get rid of the offensive nutrients. Because folks, again, back to the carnivores, the reason they want to get rid of plants is because they have offending agents. Everything has an offending agent in it. All plants have a positive, all plants have a negative. And I'm going to say the same thing about meats. Yeah. You know, it's all about finding what's right for your body and not mm-hmm. getting so um, dogmatic about and, and we know, and, 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 and we know that you can take a, a, um, a vegetable, any vegetable, and some people can handle it in its raw form, mm-hmm. no problems. But when they cook it, they can't eat it. And vice versa for others. Some people can, um, they do great when it's cooked, but they cannot handle it in its raw state. Mm -hmm. And these are things that you have to consider. It's all about enzymatic activity. What enzymes are, might you be lacking in, you know? Because the cooking deactivates the enzymes. A lot of the enzymes. The cooking also deactivates some of the offensive agents. Exactly. Like like the oxalates and things like that. Exactly. Exactly. I do better with... And I've noticed in this with my own self is some vegetables I tend to digest better when they're in their raw form versus when they are cooked. Yep. So um, there's so, so many things to consider when you're trying to determine what foods might be good or bad for well, you. Let's just try to tie all that together as far as I'm not, again, if, if they work for you, stick with them. But don't throw everything out just because it's on this diet. Uh, You know, everybody wants to get rid of all dairy. Well, what part of the dairy is problematic for you? Is it the casein protein? Is it whey? Is it lactose? Is it some type of other protein? Is it the A1 or A2 casein? Exactly. So, and, and all dairy is not the same. The milk that you buy in the store is crap. I would not, I don't recommend that you even drink that stuff. That The pasteurization process destroys a lot of the necessary enzymes that you need to um, digest milk. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, I don't think we should be drinking glasses of milk anyway. Right. Um, but, you know, if you uh, were to consume yogurt, that's a different, you know, that, that, dairy pre- that dairy has been processed differently and it's going to, your body's going to recognize it differently. Well, they, they, they still pasteurize it to kill everything, but then it's re-inoculated. Right. And then that allows it to break down that food and make it more digestible for us. Same with cheeses with the enzymes. All they, the different soft cheeses, hard cheeses, yeah, the, they're not all the same. No, they're not. Nor should they be just lumped into one big group and avoided. Well, if you look at how we evolved, I think you can kind of see where they're each, they all get their little points. Like we, we evolved from meat or we evolved from plants. We are both right. I mean, if you want to go back to the most primitive, we should eat algae. That's, that's where we started. We were algae eaters. And then we ate plants. And then we ate plants, insects, and whatever we could find. But then we started eating meat and fat. And that made our brains grow. And that is, you know, that was part of our evolution is that the, our ability to eat more meat. And you look at the primates. Uh, the gorilla has the smallest of, of, the, of the great primates. The gorilla has the smallest brain. They're vegetarian. The chimpanzee and uh, the orangutan, they, especially the chimpanzee, they eat monkeys. Mm-hmm. Periodically, they'll hunt them, and they eat the brains of the monkey first because they know it's high fat content. I mean, they know what they're doing. Right. And chimpanzees are more, you know, are, are more smart. intelligent. So, the eat, consumption of meat and fat evolved our brain, but that evolved brain evolved Neolithic agriculture. Right. And so, 
you can make a case for all meat or all veget vegetables, but you're ignoring the fact that we evolved this way. And then what did we do with those? You know, if you're carnivore, you're still eating Neolithic meat. If you're vegetarian, you're still eating Neolithic vegetables yeah. and grains. So you're not going back to what you think. I always like to look, and you, you were a big fan of food anthropology. In fact, you wanted to be one, right? Mm -hmm. That's uh, what I wanted to do after I finished my diet dietetics degree and internship and realized that it probably wasn't going to be for me. I wanted to study food anthropology. Mm -hmm. It's that, fascinating. It is fascinating because that, that's, that's huge. It's like, well, how do you know this? Well, we have old teeth that we can find in the dent and we can find what they were eating. Every once in a while we find a mummified or frozen person that gives us insights. Um, all of them are eating plants. All of them were eating meat, you know, from what we right. can see. But you look at... Well, you just think about where a lot of these people were living at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the, the... Especially when we talk about Egyptians and the pharaohs, when they, you know, what they were buried with. Well, they lived along the Nile River, mm -hmm. one of the most fertile places in the world right. at the time. And uh, why would they only eat meat? when they had all the other. But, and if meat was best for them, I guarantee they would have because they were very advanced yeah. and they didn't. They ate everything. And um, same thing with vegetarian, they didn't eat just vegetables, they ate everything. So if you look at that type of food anthropology, you can see that there's, you cannot really make a strong case for either one. And then when you talk about Neolithic, we learned how to prepare those foods to make them more palatable to us. And we realized that they did good things for us. That's why we kept doing it. It's medicine. Right. That's what I, 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 I don't think we wouldn't continue to eat stuff if, if everybody was like dying from it. No, they just said, you know, they, they want to say, well, we only ate them because we were starving. It's like, uh, tell that oh. to me this morning when we were out eating our blueberries. Yeah, it's, I got hungry this morning and I was like, there's nothing in the fridge because we're about to leave for Colorado and we haven't gone to the grocery store. I'm talking about the fridge is bare. So I was like, what am I going to eat? So I just went out in the garden and started eating blueberries with Bo. <laughs> Because Bo likes them too. He just right off the bush. Right off the bush, just popping them in my mouth. They were so good. And those are, uh, those are carbs. That's and poison. then I went back and started working on my taxes. <laughs> but that's that's poison. <laughs> those are carbs. Well, that's you know that's I want to tie those all together because if you look at your blue zones, mm -hmm. it's the best window we have. Because people, you know, everyone wants to argue. I feel great on this diet, but how long have you been on it? Three years. Well, I'm talking about a lifetime. This is what we're looking at. Yeah. What, what is going to get me to a blue zone type lifespan? Folks, for those who don't know who, what a blue zone is, blue zones are a designation to different areas around the world where they have large amounts of their population who make it to 100 or over, and they're still in good health. Right. They have their mental faculties, and they also have their physical abilities. And they're not obese, and they don't have a lot of chronic illness. No, and there's one in... Um, Costa Rica, there's one in Greece, there's one in Italy, Sardinia, there's Okinawa, Japan, California, Loma Linda, California, which is it's the Seventh Day Adventist. Mm -hmm. So it's more of a, a, you know, not a genetic group, but more of a, a, a like minded thinking group. And then you have some of the in the Ural Mountains, some of the Georgians that I mean, I have a, some of my your on your family, you have a lot of people who make it into their 90s and hundred and I do too. Yeah. So, I mean, genetics do make a part, but they all ate this way. Right. If you look at all those diets, none of them are all meat. None of them are all veg veg vegetarian. vegetarian. Um, there are some vegetarians, but they're ovo-lacto. Loma Linda is probably the best window we have because diverse genetic group, but they, there are some who are vegetarians. There are some who are pescatarians, which means vegetarian plus fish. And then there are some who eat good meats in addition to those. Uh, the pescatarians and the people who eat the meat live the longest. The strict vegan vegetarians don't live as long. Um, the one common thread between all these different groups, some eat dairy, some do not. Some eat more grains, less grains. Um, you know, Sardinia is Italy. They've only been eating tomatoes for 500 years, yet that's an important part of their blue zone diet. So when people look at genetics, they want to go all the way back. But these epigenetics, what have they been exposed to in the last... 100, 500 years makes a big difference. That's a big difference when it comes to dairy. That's why Sub-Saharan Africa cannot handle dairies. They were never exposed to it, or the Asians. And just the, the environment in which they live dictates a lot of their DNA expression and a lot of their ways that they utilize the nutrients that they're consuming. 
So that has to be taken into account as well. well so if you and that and that and now you're getting very very complicated. Well, what makes them live long goes back to your saying is that it's a lot more than just diet. Absolutely. So like I said, some of them eat dairy, some do not. Some of them eat grains more or less. There's a, a lot of different variations mm-hmm. in these diet. Uh, most of them don't eat a ton of animal protein. And most of them don't eat a ton of grains either. They have a very balanced... But they also, the, the quality of their food is very high too. All organic. Especially, yes, it's all organic, non-GMO, especially for in Europe, they don't even allow, you know... GMO. GMO. So mm-hmm. I wish we could get to that point here, but I'm afraid the genie's out of the bottle. Oh, Monsanto has bought, bought and paid for all of our, our congressional I know, people. I know, So the, if you look at these zones, the only thing they have in common with their diet or with their, with their life is faith and family. Mm-hmm. It's very, very important. Lower stress, good support group. Right. This is the common thread amongst all these groups. Um, you know, they have commonalities in diet, but they're all very different. And none of them match that. Um, the, well, they do match. Um, none of them match the paleo. None of them match the carnivore. None of them match the vegan. You know, the, the grains that they eat they are soaking, they're sprouting, they're fermenting. These are all, they're combining with other foods. These are all things that mitigate those bad things. Um, so, you know, paleo is good if you don't want to do all that. Correct. You know, you so it's just kind of like, what are you willing to do? And that's why, you know, I think our health coaches do a great job of, you know, we can tell you to do all of these things and eat all these foods and prepare them all this way. But at the end of the day, are you going to do it? And what is realistic? What's practical? Because that's what we have to come to terms with. What are you willing to do? Uh, we hope you're willing to do a little bit more than what you're doing now. And, and as far as seeing your food as medicine, because that's what it is. It can either be medicine or poison. It's just you, you know. So, um, but at the end of the day, it's got to be practical and realistic. Or you're not going to stick with it. Or are you going to, yeah, is it is something you can, is it an intervention diet? Right. Or is, is, it it, is it short term or is this long term? Lots of times we do use short term interventions. Like the keto. To get a handle of your symptoms and, 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 and um, you know, deal with a lot of your uh, metabolic derangements and nutrient deficiencies. We've got to get your body working right again. So interventions short term are necessary, but then we like to delve into, okay, the intervention is over or getting near the end. What are we going to do? Mm-hmm. You know, exactly. and if, and if things creep back up, go back to your intervention again. I mean, I'd like to try a carnivore diet on one of our patients who do not respond to your normal, because you've had great set success I'm Help. not doing a carnivore diet on anybody. You don't think so? No. Even if they failed with all the things we try? If they, it'd probably be the last resort. Okay. Because folks, we've had, you know, people. Because everyone would troll me when I uh, the carnivores. Like I've, I'm much better now. I'm not having Crohn's. Maybe or, it's or, an intervention of some. Although sort, I'm talking, you know? I'm only talking intervention. Okay. I'm only talking about intervention because it is an elemental diet, and I like it better than the amino acid cocktail. Yeah. I mean, I think that's junk. So, but. These people, I, I couldn't engage in a conversation because they're they're too. Yeah, we can on they're, Twitter. They're too passionate. But you have had great success with UC and IBS and Crohn's with your patients. But not all of them have been cured. But you've helped a lot mm-hmm. with our other ones. So it's not like carnivore or this. It's, yeah. It, but I'd be interested to try it for when everything else fails as an intervention. So if it's an intervention diet, that's the short term. Some other ones that we could look at would be like um, AIP. That's a good, that's an intervention one. And it's not, you know, it's just, it's autoimmune protocol. Mm -hmm. Um, It's basically trying to figure out, you know, there's certain foods that people tend to have, especially when they have autoimmune diseases, they tend to have problems with certain foods. We see a common theme. Um, And and the most common foods that people have problems with are um, wheat, grains that that especially contain gluten. But, you know, those things contain other proteins that are problematic for people as well dairy um soy soy corn primarily because it's gmo but some people have a true corn issue Mm -hmm. and sensitivity um eggs are a big one i can't do eggs Mm -hmm. and uh beans and legumes despite how you prepare them ferment them and soak them they still have problems with them right you know and then nuts to various degrees but you can have a problem with any food you know, and then again, you have to, like I just said earlier, you've got to uh, consider, wh- is it a preparation issue with that food? Do you do better in its raw state or in its 
semi-cooked state or and it's a very cooked state. And also the selection. You know, a good example would be potatoes. On the AIP protocol, they're not going to eat potatoes. Solanine is the offensive antagonist ingredient in a potato. When you see a potato in the store and it has that green tint to it, that's the solanine. So that's why, you know, you look back at our answers, they were always peeling potatoes. But, but in all the nutrients in the peeling, yes, but so are the anti-nutrients. So we used to dig the potatoes out of the ground when they were dirty, and then we'd put them in our root cellar, which was dark. They didn't develop solanine that way. Right. But now we wash them and we put them in the store and they're exposed to light and they develop well, solanine. a lot of people do. Some people have some smarts and don't do that. But the, again, this is a selection and preparation, the peeling. Mm-hmm. Same thing with your um, nightshades like eggplant or tomatoes. A vine ripened tomato, the, the, the tomatine is very high in a green tomato that is picked green and, and then ripens when you ship it, mm-hmm. which is all the ones in the store, because the ones in the store are selected for shipability. So they want something they can pick in Argentina or Mexico and make it last for the month journey up here and have a shelf life in the store. That's why they're poison. It's not the tomato, but when we go out and pick a tomato from our vines, mm-hmm. it does not have that because it's a selection issue. Right. So when people get all aggro about nightshades or grains or legumes, you have to look at selection and preparation before. Cause I don't want and the that. latex gene that's been inserted. Oh, that's a great one. You, yeah. In some of our, to, our, in our tomatoes. Tell, so Amy had a patient which we could not figure out which, what was going on. She was just reacting to things. It was like, what is going on? And she was an OR nurse, and she developed a latex allergy, which is um, not uncommon. Cause through, a lot of people have latex allergies. Yeah, through, well, also through repeated exposure, you yes. can actually develop one. So she it's de- just, and it's basically probably in just an immune system that is way, it's just kind of gone haywire. But she had a latex intolerance. She also had a tomato fetish. And she's she, eating tons of tomatoes. And they were the ones that were being shipped in. They actually inserted, a, you know about why are GMOs bad? Well, here's an example. They inserted the latex gene, which is a lectin, mm-hmm. into the tomato in order to make it more shelf life. And a lectin is a, um, it's a... It's a protein. It's a protein, but it's a, it's a, it's like a messenger. It's a, it's, it's a communicator. It's just kind of signaling another way that cells communicate with each other is via... A lectin protein. And they have an affinity to, to grab onto things. Yes. So that's that's why they use them so much in cancer research is that because lectins are great at responding to, you know, attached to a cell. Right. But anyway, that's how we solved it. She was we were able to figure out that she was eating tomatoes and it wasn't the tomato, it was the latex. So there's a good example of not, you shouldn't eat tomatoes. Like, no, you shouldn't eat latex. Latex. Tomatoes. Tomatoes. Yeah. They, I mean, they've really, they have manipulated so much of our food supply. It's really hard to grasp you know, what What can we eat? What, and what is really going on when we eat this food? Why can you not tolerate that? Is it because of what they've done to it? Could you tolerate an organic uh, or a different variety that's grown in another country? Mm-hmm. You know, wh- what what's going on here? They've um, just muddied the waters qu- very well. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you look, meats, you know, are unhealthy because of the omega-6 content, but the omega-6 content is because of the way we raise them. Right. You know, grass-fed beef can actually have a pretty high omega-3. Corn-fed beef does not. Correct. So, I mean, these are things that, you know, it gets complicated. And the farm-raised fish is a whole other issue. Do not eat it, folks. Just, it is, it just is, stay away. Is Please stay away from the tilapia. I, I mean, I hear well, people, I see it on the menus, and I see people, oh, I'll have the tilapia. And I'm like, oh, that's like the worst thing you could order on this menu. Well, because of the way they're raised. Right. Um, and the same thing with the farm-raised salmon. I mean, they're actually putting orange dye in their food to make their flesh orange, to make it look like a real salmon. It should just be criminal. And people are like, I'm eating salmon. I'm that, how is that allowed? Our FDA allows so much BS. They are owned outright by Big Ag and Big Farm. Do not trust these people, okay? No. Just don't. Yeah, it's so. I stopped trusting them a long time ago. Um. Let's go over the couple of the processed food crap. Okay, weight, yeah. Weight, weight, weight Watchers and Nutrisystem. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Calorically correct crap. Yeah, and again, and that brings up another thing about the calories. You know, people are still counting calories. And I was taught to do that as a dietitian. It was all about calories, proteins, fats, and carbs. Like, that was the only thing to consider. And I know I use this example all the time, but 
a hundred calories of avocado behaves very differently metabolically speaking than a hundred calories of a donut. Mm -hmm. One is going to cause inflammation. The other is going to prevent it. So you stop viewing calories as, as equal. It, they, they are not. Stop, stop counting calories, period. I can't tell you the last time I considered calorie content in my food. I just don't. Because you're eating good quality. Because food. I focus more on the quality. When I approach my food, I'm like, is this going to harm me or help me? And that's how I make my food selections. And I just try to, and, and for me, it's easier because I, this is like second nature to me. But, you know, I like, you know, I make sure I'm getting, you know, lots of my green leafy, leafy vegetables and other, a, a wide variety of vegetables because that's good for me. I make, uh, I make sure that my, um, my animal sources, my proteins are high quality, my, our fats, high quality. And I eat when I'm hungry, and I stop as soon as I'm not hungry. Mm -hmm. Okay? These are just ways of, you know, and these are habits, and these are very hard to overcome when you've ignored food and hunger cues for so long. You don't, a lot of people don't even know what it feels like to be hungry anymore because they eat according to the clock. And because or boredom. Or boredom or anxiety or they're in the office and every, you know how you, if you worked in an office, there is food everywhere. There's always that one person or more than one person is bringing in something they cooked the night before, brownies, cake, pies, whatever. And, uh, or there's somebody that's got the candy bowl on their desk all the time. And so we're just constantly shoving stuff in our face. We don't even know what it feels like to be hungry. And that's, a, that's something that we try to address with our patients is just to, we've got to start understanding and, and learning about your hunger cues now. Well, and so much of that is driven by the carb cycle and the um, insulin spike and that vicious do loop. And that's why so many people who do any of these diets do well. Not not nutrient systems or weight watchers, but the other ones they do well because that stuff is crap. That that there's no there's nothing high quality about anything in those those foods. Well, and it doesn't have satiety because it doesn't have fat in it. Because they're so worried about calories, they omit the fat, which gives you satiety. It gives you the the ability to go longer between meals and not feel the hunger. And, and then, if and if you're eating a lot of carbs all the time, chances are you've probably got some yeast overgrowth. Mm -hmm. And those ye and, and yeast are a normal part of your GI microbiome. They're supposed to be there. But when they start growing out of control and start replacing a lot of the good bacteria that should be there, they they will make you uh, crave carbs because that's what they need to um, thrive and reproduce. And so and um, you'll, you'll actually get these signals sent to your brain that, like, I need carbs, I need carbs. I mean, it actually goes up our vagus nerve. Yeah, it's a I mean, yeah. communication system. These bacteria that reside in our GI tract, the microbiome, you know, they, um, they produce metabolites that communicate directly with your brain and, and other places in your body. Because you always call this, the stomach the second brain. Yes, or the GI tract, the gut, is the second brain. Because it sends so many signals to it's our It's a brain. constant communication between your brain and your, and your stomach, and your stomach is... Not your stomach, but your GI tract. There's so much going on there. It's a huge part of your immune system. And so it's it's doing all kinds of things that regulate your body's uh, metabolic activities. Mm -hmm. And some people are now even referring to it as our first brain. Is that it, it does that much for our body. There's so many things it regulates. And it's directly coming from the activities of our GI microbiome and the immune system that is associated with our gut. So an inflammatory, high-carb diet will grow these things that will scream the loudest. And they will... produce toxic metabolites that are bad for your liver. So all around bad, but they're also part of the do loop of, I need more junk food. Right. And so if you have to heal your gut to lose your butt, that's what you always hear yeah. say. <laughs> we had this, we had a... When we were um, focusing on weight loss a long time ago, we had this wonderful weight loss program, um, that we, and that was our tagline, was if you want to lose your butt, you got to heal your gut. <laughs> it went over well with most people. <laughs> yeah. Some people like a bigger butt. So, so you know, that's why the Weight Watchers and, and Nutrisystems do not work. It's inflammatory food. It's calorically correct. You'll lose, cal you'll lose weight initially because of the calories, but then you're going to... Inflamed but I body. see these people who do it, and they're always trying to lose weight. Right. It's like it never works. And I'm like, why do you keep doing that? Well, I lost weight that one time, 
And um, but I'm like, but you're you're struggling yeah, to should, keep it off. It should come more naturally. Yeah, and, and again, that's they focus on food. Everybody wants to focus on the diet and not all the other things that are directly causing you systemic inflammation and metabolic derangements that are going to put weight on you. Well, that's and we're going to be talking about those. I mean, that's why you developed your program, the Total Gut Job, which is basically a, 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 a systematic approach where you. Eliminate all most. Well, so, yeah. So the total gut job is, and I created this program because so many people don't have access to functional medicine doc, doctors. They can't afford them. And this is a, a program that I use on a lot of my patients because it gets great results. And we spend a lot of time developing it, but it's, it's basically um, trying to um, get rid of systemic inflammation. That's the ultimate goal. And to uh, correct a lot of metabolic derangements by healing the gut Mm -hmm. and lowering that uh, systemic inflammation that is coming from the gut. And yes, food is a bit, diet is a big part of that. We do an elimination reintroduction diet to see if you have any food intolerances and sensitivities. Which only works if your gut's healthy. Which only, and that's why we rehab it before we reintroduce foods because you don't want to reintroduce these foods when on a on a permeable gut because you'll have false positives you'll get yeah so there's a lot of strategic thinking involved in this but we're also addressing all of the other lifestyle um behaviors and environmental exposures that are also contributing to gut issues and inflammation so it's um it's a great way to find out the perfect diet for you Mm -hmm. it really is that that is the, the perfect diet is Find out what's for you. And then even then you have to maybe after, experiment a little bit more afterwards just yeah. to fine tune some things. Yeah, like when you, you talked about raw versus cooked, that doesn't mean all vegetables raw and all vegetables cooked. You know, it could be that for spinach you do better with cooked, but it might do, you know, for um, broccoli you might do better raw. You have to find that out because is it more of an enzyme issue for you or is it because of the... Um, oxalates or the goinconoids and even then it can fluctuate throughout your lifetime you know Mm -hmm. just depending on what's going on in your gut but if your gut's healthy you're cognizant of what's good and bad that's what most people don't realize they feel like crap all the time so they have no idea if a food is antagonistic because they never yeah we have our bodies down that i was able to determine eggplant was antagonistic to me i never would have thought in a million years eggplant was because i love it i eat i make bubba ganoush for us all the time and I was finally like, I have a little tingling on my lips. And it was not a huge one, but it's like, okay, my body is reacting a little bit mm-hmm. to this. That I would never have noticed that if I had been an inflamed mess. But a lot of people, you know, don't never make, you know, never put two and two together that this food is causing their joint pain or this food is causing their headache because it can take up to 72 hours after you consume a certain food for it to show to to bring about those effects Mm -hmm. and then it can take up to three months for that inflammation to die down um now it can vary of course sometimes it takes only a bite of a food to to start that um immune response Uh, and sometimes it takes more it just depends on you but a lot of people who especially if they consume dairy and wheat they're eating it all the time and they're never going you know a long enough time eliminating it to see if it's truly a problem Mm -hmm. and even some of our patients will cheat on the program you know they think they can cheat they 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 go through the program and oh well we had to go to this party and ate some pizza and i'm like great you just had wheat and dairy and really bad wheat and dairy and, and bad, so and, and now, bad tomato and if that is an issue for you is just set off a systemic inflammatory response i don't know how bad it's going to be but it's going to you know impact our data now we have to let it calm back down so it's anyway it's a it's a, it's a great program um, and if you've struggled with weight issues and chronic inflammation again obesity is a, a symptom of of, of inflammation and metabolic derangements, just like all of our other chron- most of our other chronic diseases that we have these days. If you're struggling to lose the weight, I highly encourage you to check out the program. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's a self-study. We provide tons and tons of support. Um, you should be able to do it on your own, but if you get hung up, guess what? You can work with one of our health coaches and they can get you right back on track. Because you're basically, this is a, a way of creating the 
your, your diet, your perfect diet. And because if you, if you look at the Mediterranean diet, if we had to, if we had to say you know what is one diet we like it's it's the Mediterranean diet. a Mediterranean likes diet which and these are general principles I, general principles still apply you know it's it's high quality it's not a lot of simple carbs and sugars um, the the carbs tend to be complex they're not you don't eat a ton of them what is a complex like acorn squash acorn squash oatmeal beans and legumes those are complex carbs they have a lot of fiber in them so you don't get those insulin spikes mm-hmm. it, and it depends on what you're eating them with and, and yes and if you're eating them with fat and things like that it even slows the response more you know so food combinations again play a you know are important as well but you know lots of vegetables lots of real food no processed foods but the Mediterranean diet also allows you to do, or if you get to the end, it really is the principles that we, we apply. It doesn't throw out all dairy. And you could call it a Mediterranean diet, or you could also call it a, a my grandma's diet. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it doesn't. Because that's how she ate as well. They don't throw out all food groups. If they eat dairy, sometimes it's yogurt, sometimes it's kefir, sometimes it's, it's cheese. It's cheese, yeah. You know, with wheat, it's been non-GMO, and it's been fermented and soured. Folks, we never had... It's just when we, when we started eating yeast bread that we quit fermenting. Prior to 100 years ago, everything we ate was sourdough. Mm-hmm. Sourdough is a bacteria. Sourdough breaks down that gluten. It makes and the it sourdough cool. you get in Kroger is not, not sourdough. That's vinegar. That, that, they use vinegar. It is not, that is not traditional sourdough bread. In fact, it's very difficult to find traditional. Like out in San Francisco, there's a, there's a place that still makes sourdough bread. And they're using the, for, for over 100 years, they make a big thing of bread, of, ye- of dough, mm-hmm. they cut it in half, they make bread that day out of half, and then they take the other half and they feed it. Yeah. The next day, the same thing. So technically, they have the same dough for the last hundred years. They just take half of it to use it and then feed the other half to grow it to the same size, and that's their process, and that's the only amount of bread they make. That's why we have health problems with bread, because no one does that. You yeah. Know, they like, I want to mass produce Wonder Bread and... And, and they want to throw out names like it's, you know, it's whole wheat or it's like, no, no, folks, don't fall for that. It's, it's so complicated. These, all these labels are just confusing to you. And really when it comes down to diet, it's really, uh, it's your diet is there to, um, you know, we need to eat to live and not live to eat. Mm-hmm. The food should be our medicine. They're there to provide our nutrients that our body needs to um, make all these reactions occur. We got thousands of reactions occurring in our body every second, and they all require nutrients, specific nutrients and specific amounts to do so. So the food is one way we get those nutrients, but it's also um, feeding our gut microbiome mm-hmm. and what it's doing to our immune system and our GI tract. That's how you need to start looking at your food, is what is it going to do to my GI microbiome and my immune system and my GI tract, and how is it providing the nutrients that my body needs to meet my day's um, requirements. And those requirements differ from person to person because we all have different activity levels, different environmental toxin exposures, different stressors, and things like that. And, and no, everybody wants to simplif- oversimplify it well, like the glu- because that's how you sell stuff. Right. Well, a good example of that would be the gluten-free cra- craze. Most of the gluten-free products out on the market are crap. Yes. Yes, yes. Just because it's gluten, doesn't have gluten, but it has other grains that have gluten-like properties that are not still have not been prepared And properly. that's why a lot of our people who come in and are like, I'm gluten-free and I'm still having all these problems. And you look at what they're eating, you're like, well, just because it's gluten-free, I mean, it's, you're making really poor choices very, very poor choices. I'll use this example and then we'll go on to the next thing. There are, there are still tribes in Africa that are very, very poor, and some of them subsist on just one or two different grains. Uh, there are a couple areas that subsist mainly on sorghum. Sorghum is a, uh, is, is a grain also. People think, oh, sorghum's like the syrup. Well, that's the bottom stalk. The right. top has a nice, beautiful grain head. They're poor, this is what they eat, and it's what the majority of their diet. But because of that, they go to great lengths to make that palatable to them. If you're just eating a little bit of something, sometimes you can get away with it, and that little bit of antagonist is not an issue. But there, they are sprouting it. Then they ferment it. And then they cook it. I mean, they go through all these different processes to, in order to make it, um, to get rid of all the anti-nutrients. Because they, they know that they're eating so much of it, if they don't do these things, they'll have health problems. Right. So that's a good example of the preparation versus the amount paradigm you have to look at. 
don't get freaked out if you have a bite of a latex tomato. It's not going to derail you if you have that on your sandwich. But you kind of think, is the amount and how do I react to it? Right. Um, and there are certain foods that are bad for us, but in small amounts are good. That, a lot of, that's what a lot of medicines are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, a lot of your herbs, you know. Would kill uh, you if you ate a bunch uh, of them. Right, but in small amounts and, and used appropriately at certain times are very beneficial. Mm-hmm. And we've, we've been taught this before, but we've forgotten. A lot of our religions taught us the whole kosher and halal is basically food preparation and, and, and sanitation issues to prevent us from killing ourselves. Don't eat this with that. Don't eat, you know, during these months. Kill it this way. These were all rules to prevent us from spoilage and... And, and fasting is the same way. It's, it's all, it, it used to be thought of as a religious practice solely, but now we understand that it has very, you know, a lot of health benefits. And we're going to be talking about fasting in an, an upcoming podcast. Well, we're going to, um, hit, we're going to hit a little bit here on podcast. that. Well, I want to wait until um, I, I, the IFM conference that we just attended, there was a, a, a couple of lectures on fasting and timing and how our circadian rhythms and, and everything. So we'll, and put, so we'll put it in that one. I, I want to wait and uh, do that one. All right. We'll talk the, about the, that. The quick answer to that is limiting the, the when you consume calories and having a longer period of time when you don't is beneficial to the body. Well, because you're giving your immune system a break. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. you're not stimulating your immune system. When you're eating all the time, you're stimulating your immune system. And depending on what you eat, you're doing it, in, you know, badly or, or not as badly, you know. So uh, fasting is definitely something I, I'm a fan of. It works great for a lot of people. You don't have to do it every day, but it, it, it does have a lot of health benefits and that's why they put it in the religions because the fear of god will make you and do there, things. but there are sometimes then you do not need to fast and there mm-hmm. there are exceptions to that people who have um really bad adrenal fatigue and exhaustion probably shouldn't be fasting it's not going to turn out well for them can i give my seder supper example let this get that gets way too nerdy so let's just hold that one i got, I got one I've already said it now here's a little <laughs> interesting historical thing so the Seder supper for the Jewish people is a, um, they eat bitter herbs and they eat unleavened bread. The bitter herbs would remind them of the slavery that they were um, subjected to in Egypt. And, you know, they have, the, it's all symbolic. But, but normally you would never eat unleavened bread. When I said before about Ezekiel, put them in a pot and ferment them, that's the opposite of unleavened bread. So unleavened bread is just this wheat that's flat. Yep. Bread. And not prepared properly. What's going on there? The bitter herbs stimulate bile production. The lectins in unleavened bread attach to the bile duct. You can't tell me that's not done on purpose for some reason. And usually it's combined with fasting and other things. Yeah. This religious ceremony was basically just a way of creating good health. It's, it's kind of a detox. Mm-hmm. And I love, this is back to the food. Maybe empire. the sweat tents and things like that too. Again, detoxification. Yeah. I mean, all these different cultures, this, this is where it goes back to food anthropology is so important because. It's a little extreme form of detoxification for me, but. Well, it, it, it just. I feel like I'm in a sweat tent in Arkansas in the summertime anyway. And we don't, we don't need. That's why we're about to split. <laughs> go to Colorado. We're about to go to Colorado because home grill does not do well with the heat and humidity here in Arkansas. I did when I was little. I don't know what happened to me. Maybe I just got old and cranky, but I just can't handle it anymore. Well, hope you guys have a, a good grasp of, you know, everything's not crystal clear. Yeah. You got you to heal your gut, and then you can figure bottom, out your body. Bottom line is there are no magic diets. Stop falling for that. Um, there is a way to determine the the best diet for you Mm -hmm. but it it takes strategic steps and it's all about healing your gut and being really good to your microbiome and getting that back in balance and uh and and going through an elimination reintroduction diet i think that's something everybody if you're struggling with weight or other chronic issues you must do an elimination and reintroduction diet but you need to do it right there's a lot of um documents out there and programs to do an elimination reintroduction diet on the internet that do not reintroduce the foods correctly and they're going to give you bad results. Yeah, you're going to end up throwing out a lot of foods that that you didn't need to. Because what we're trying to do with this perfect diet is it's going to look at what you need based on your activity because you're going to respond well to it. Your gut's healthy, so you can get good data. It's also taking into effect your genetics and your epigenetics. Remember I said epigenetics is what has happened in, in the last you know, 500. Right. You know, it's what your grandparents did. 
It's the reason some people can tolerate milk and not because the, the genes were passed on because you were eating more milk. And there's a lot of other things also dictate how well you deal, you know, the health of your GI tract. And that that's when we talk about, you know, and this program goes over that, about your environmental exposures, your medi- the medications you might be taking. So many things to consider mm-hmm. that these books about, you know, veganism or, or some type of diet, they, they're, they're not going to address that. If the goal of your diet is not to have a wide variety as possible, it's probably not a good idea. If it's super narrow... What's not a good idea? If, if a diet plan you're looking at oh. tries to be very narrow, I would be very skeptical yes. of it. Yeah. Could it have short-term results, near-term, mid-term results? Yeah. Absolutely. But not we're, long-term. We're looking at how do you live to 100 with your mental faculties and still move around. That's and, that's and our feel goal. good and feel good and have a high quality of life. That's the goal here is to live long with a high quality of life. I mean, the, the, one of the gurus from these diets, you know, he's all huge and buff, but he's like, okay, you're working out all the time, and you're you're. This is your job, dude. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like a, a it is, well, like a supermodel. Your job is to look thin. Well, that's how he makes his money. Yeah. So he's pushed this, and of course, you do get because it's you get these short term results. So. Be skeptical of that. Our goal is the wide variety. Because remember, food is medicine, and the medicine is contained in so many different things. And God made us to be able to forage and look around, and also God assumed that we'd have some brains. Common sense. Yeah, yeah. To, to think about what's... Let, let, let's just, just, let's just use some logic, you know. Just just think about some things. Trust your brain, okay? And, and um, let's not go on emotion, but let's think through... Think through things logically. And it's not as complicated as it seems because if you get rid of processed foods, if you go back a hundred years prior to processed foods, we didn't have these problems. So all these crazy diets that people are looking at are trying to solve new, new world issues. And modern world issues, yeah. exactly. Which are stress, toxins. Poor food quality. Poor food quality. As a, and so they're trying to create these elaborate crazy diets to solve the new world problems. Like, Just oh, step, step back. Yeah. Step back and see where... What new modern world problems you're bringing on yourself? Because mm-hmm. you can get away from it. Some, a lot of it, you can. A hundred years ago, we were thin. Yeah, I know. I was just looking at pictures of my um, grandparents. I saw my aunt posted one on Facebook, and they were they were you know mid fifties, I would say, and just thin as could be. Mm-hmm. You know, and I look at all my the pictures of a lot of my um, aunts and uncles and cousins and um, grandparents and. They're all thin. For our older people who watch our pot, this Jackie Gleason, you know, from the Honeymooners, his nickname was the Fat Man. Today, you would look at him like, eh, he's carrying a few extra pounds. But that was so unusual then that he was the the Fat Man. Now it, everyone's fat. Well, and you know, I hate to say it, but I, our current medical system, I think, is contributing to the problem. Oh, you think? <laughs> I mean, I sometimes I'm like, I think you'd be better off taking advice from your hippie aunt and lives in a commune in North Cal- California or something. Oh, I'm ready to slap around the doctor for my mom. Mom's 90 in great health, and she's getting advice from a 300-pound, I don't know what she is. Russian or something. No, nah, she, she's Middle East. I think I she's, but, yeah, she's... We don't know. We don't know what she is, but she's 300 pounds, and she's trying to tell my mom... She can barely fit in the picture. Well, and, and she, I, I'm not... And I should... I, but no, that's not who you want mentoring your. your no, health. if 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 your doctor is carrying around that much weight, I think I'd be getting my health advice from somebody else. She didn't talk to mom about diet. All she's like, you can need this med or this med. Yeah, that's all shot. she ever talks about is you need this medication and you're due for this vaccination. She got mad at mom because she declined the new shingles vaccine. She goes, I already had the shingles vaccine. Well, this one's new and improved. She goes, I decline. She closed You'll get her, mad. She got pissed off. I know. They, they, they become a little bit tyrannical in their approach, like they're some type of God. And if you don't do what they say, then they just get, they get really mad. And I, I've, I've experienced this myself. Follow the money. They get bonuses for well, how let's, many Well, people- let's, let's don't talk about all that, but um, okay, well, just- we could have another episode on medical, medical. tyranny, because that's certainly what seems to be going on these days, and it's quite scary. All right, well, this next one's not really a diet, but people view it as a diet. Well, we're not done with the diets yet? Well, detox and cleanse. I, no, those aren't diets. Well, people think they that, are. That, that's not a diet. That's not, that's just... So, blowing your colon out 
<laughs> and losing three pounds of, of good beneficial bacteria is not a diet, folks. Well, yeah, everybody wants to talk about I'm de- you know deto- a detox diet, and well, it's all they're doing is drinking celery juice or something, and, crap, and I'm like, crapping like a goose. Yeah, and I'm like, okay, yeah, you might feel lighter because you just had you know multiple episodes of diarrhea, um, but you've also just gotten rid of a lot of your um, good bacteria. Folks, we have three three to five pounds of ba- good bacteria in our in our GI system, mm-hmm. and that's typically what people lose on a cleanse. Yeah coincidence I don't yeah and you've just lost all those wonderful bacteria and um you know a lot of these diets everybody wants to focus on you know nobody wants to think about all the bad things that you're doing in your life it's just about again it's food 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 mm-hmm. that's like that's the only thing that matters and there's a lot of other things that you have to do if you keep asking me about what magic food that you, or supplement you can take to take care of this problem i'm just going to scream if i get that question one more time yeah. i know you're you're on facebook at two o'clock in the morning you know you're 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 you have your two glasses three glasses of wine every night you're stressed out, you know, but yet you want me to recommend a magic supplement for your joint pain. You're still in the allopathic modern medicine. You want pill, to go the natural route. P- pill for an ill, but it's a natural pill. Right. Still don't want to do what's right. Right. Now, the only reason I brought up the detox, the clan, is that I want to differentiate that a detox is supporting your body's natural detox and that's abilities. Part, yeah, and that's part of our, our total gut job program is we have a detox phase. And, and, eating, and eating whole foods is actually... Facilitates and, detox. And, there's, and detox encompasses a lot of things. Our entire body is a detoxification system. Mm-hmm. The liver is the primary organ where this occurs in phase one and phase two detox pathways. And when I say we do a detox phase, we are providing the nutrients that support that detoxification system as well as supporting your GI health, which is another place where detoxification occurs. And we're encouraging to you to lower your stress, which is also going to help your detoxification. Mm-hmm. We're going to encourage you to sweat and exercise, which also helps the detoxification process. So there's lots of things to consider when you say detox, other than drinking celery juice. Well, that's why I wanted to point because there, there, there's a lot of it out there and people fall for it. And a cleanse is very different than a detox and never do a detox if it has a chelator or something to mess up your system it really should be supporting your body because your body is a de- like you said is a detox system yeah well then i want to go now to um eating Just, eating for your needs because i think that's one thing we you know we we kind of touched on it obviously you have to find out what your own diet is but i get so much pushback on carbs and we i try to point out that not all carbs are equal that a acorn squash or a sweet potato is very different than a coke right um i try to point out that we need glucose in our body your brain has to have some to function appropriately. Right. So you're either going to take protein and break it down into glucose or from your body, or you're going to, if you ingest the proper amount of carb, then you can have a readily su- su- uh, available supply of glucose and not store it as fat or get an insulin spike. I mean, I posted yesterday because the, the carnivores posted, well, po- I ate two pounds of sirloin, 12 Will eggs. Will you please get and- off these meat people? They're crazy. <laughs> but I pointed out, I was like, we just went for a two-hour bike ride. I had a sweet potato with grass-fed butter before we left, and then I came back and we ate blueberries off the, the bushes, and yeah. that was our carb load for our two-hour ride. I used up every one of those carbs and then some during that ride. Then we had a nice scallop and vegetable stir-fry. The vegetables were from our garden, zucchini and kale and fresh Yeah, pie. there were no potatoes or rice or anything like that, and I was satisfied. I didn't... No, we, we, we targeted our carbs yeah. for our usage. So when I talk about targeting, it's just being cognizant of what you're doing, mindful eating. Do I need this? Am I hungry? Am I hungry? And then what am I doing today? Am I thirsty? Mm-hmm. A lot of thirsty and hunger are interpreted very similarly by your brain. Lots of times when, you, when you're hungry, you're just really thirsty. Go drink some water. I mean, it gets complicated, folks, really quick. You know, in ketosis... It does not really work very well for anaerobic activity. So if you're doing CrossFit or doing heavy weight training, you're going to fail miserably on a ketogenic diet. I know. I have a friend who's, she's a professional cyclist and she went vegetarian or vegan, excuse me, oh, vegan. Yeah. And I'm like, ooh, it was all in, a, you know, trying to save the planet by going vegan. And I'm like, I just don't know very many professional cyclists that are vegan. 
Mm. You know, and I'm just like, it's not going to go. I just don't see that this is going to go well for you. But give it a try, girl. Let's see what happens. Um, you know. Well, again, it goes back, back to their knowledge of not understanding the food supply system. Well, see, she was feeling bad when she had dairy. She gave up dairy. You know, and because she was using a lot of dairy, so she was giving up dairy. And I'm like, that's probably why you were feeling bad. And now you've, you think vegan is the answer, and you're not real. You're again throwing everything out because this one thing was probably your issue. It might have, you might have had some type of casein problem or something like that. It's the, the main problem is a centralized food chain, because that's what creates bad animal practices. In a centralized food chain, they immediately remove that calf from that milk cow. It goes into the veal group, and then that milk cow gets milked twice a day. The way my mom, they had dairy cows. They allowed the, the baby to suckle half the day, and they took the other half. It was kind of a give and take. Right. The calf did great, and then they were able to raise meat. And if they wanted a replacement cow, everyone was happy, except for when the cow ate garlic, and then everyone was mad because they had garlic milk. I'm just thinking how, if you if you are training for a, a, a race and, and a, a professional cycling race, which are all super, super tough, mm-hmm. long miles, and you're going hardcore. How many vegetables are you having to eat to maintain that energy? We'll take it to an extreme. Of course, she's going to be eating a lot of grains and stuff too, probably a lot of bread. Again, that's not good either. Because I went and prayed correctly. You know, but so... You, you look at the Tour de France and those cyclists, they're eating... I've seen their diets. I've read up on their diets. I know what they're eating. They've got chefs that go with them everywhere, and they're preparing their meals, yep. and they're, they're high-quality foods. Fats, they, proteins, yeah, everything. Non-GMO, organic. They're eating a wide variety of foods. They're eating animal proteins. Mm-hmm. All right? There's just no way you can do all well, that. And that's they're preparing. But when they're on the bicycle, I mean, they do eat some meals while they're on the bike, but a lot of times they're sucking down glucose. Well, they're constant. They're eating a lot when they're on those bikes. They're, they're getting quick, quick sources of glucose and electrolytes. Because everyone's like, you have to have protein and fat to survive, but not carbohydrates. That is true. Technically, you do not have to have carbs. You can convert protein into glucose and, you, and your brain can use that. So, because even though your brain can use ketones, about 35% of it cannot. It has to have glucose. Right. So you're going to get it from somewhere. Why not target that right. <laughs> for that usage? And then if you're going to exercise on top of it, target that. Because I, I don't know if the uh, gluconeogenesis is hard on the body, but normally... It's well, there's more efficient. There's, there's, it's all about efficiency. Mm-hmm. When, you're, you know, when you eat carbs, getting glucose from that is super efficient. Mm-hmm. Your body has no problem. And the, but when you're trying to convert fats and proteins into glucose, it's, it's less efficient. Right. So it's always going on in the background, but now suddenly you're going to force your body to do it all the time. Where did we do this before? Never. So that's why I was like, okay, ding, ding, ding. This doesn't go with the food anthropology like we've talked about. At least as we know it up until this point. Now, if I'm presented with more information and new information, that might change the way I feel. But as for now, that's so kind of what I've, the conclusion I've come to. People have asked me what we eat, and we eat a, um, a modified Mediterranean diet. If we eat grains and beans, I prepare them. We eat a traditional Southern diet. If you want to really talk about traditional, which is basically an African diet. We'll eat from the garden, and then you properly prepare your grains and legumes. You know, a lot of our, a lot of our Southern traditional meals are basically adaptations of foods that came from Africa. A lot of our greens, yep. And so, so it's very healthy. I mean, our grandparents ate out of the garden, and they slaughtered their own animals that were on their farm, and they weren't eating you know, meat every day. They were cooking that pot roast or that fried chicken, you know, on Sundays or, or maybe once or twice during the week, you know, just depends. But they were eating out of their garden and they were healthy because of it. It's, it's like the, um, the tech people in San Francisco, they, they drink that stuff, soyant, which is uh, supposed to be everything you need in a can. Like, but you, you look at them, these people are so unhealthy. They're, they're, they're estrogen- well, are they doing just sitting in a desk with- Tapping on keys they at the computer they, all day yeah, underneath this, artificial light, never going outside. And all the toxic exposure. This is what we're talking about. Diet's part of it, but it's all the other things. Yeah. 
So I think we've covered it well. I know I think so. we didn't tell you with a perfect diet. You have to determine yes. this. Yes. But we've given you the... Sorry, in- it's not that easy. But we've given you the tools to at least start thinking mm-hmm. logically about and, and, it. And how you want to think about your food and, and what you need to be consuming. Mm-hmm. A lot of things to consider. You're, you need to consider um, your, your activity needs, your environmental exposures, you know, uh, where you are in your life, um, and, and start thinking about your food as uh, medicine and uh, a way to feed your microbiome that basically dictates all of your metabolic activities. Yeah, and, you and, and, and you may have short-term needs or mid-term needs that you need to augment. I'm trying to rehab my hip because I have a problem, mm-hmm. so I've increased my collagen intake. Mm-hmm. Simple. I'm not going to go on an all-collagen diet. I'm having a lot of wrinkles on my neck and face, and so I'm doing collagen too. She's so hard on herself. She's so pretty. I ruined my face, but my mother told me I'd be laying out in the backyard or whatever. You know, I was I'm fair skinned and always wanted to be tan, like my best friend who's part Cherokee, I think. Um, and it never would happen. And I just ruined my skin trying to keep up with her. Same thing with me. I, it seems like everyone I associated early in life. All my friends were dark. We go to the beach. All my would, boyfriends I, were dark. And they would. And I, I would blister, and they would tan. Yeah, I'm here sitting underneath the umbrella and just looking like a lobster, and they're just you know tanning away. And so anyway, it has certainly had its effect on my skin. Well, there's a good example of listening to what your body needs. Yeah, I wish you, I would listen to my mom. Well, your body was telling you also. Well, now wish you'd listen to me, yeah. Mom. All right. Okay. So that's it. I hope you got some valuable information from this. Or um, a starting point. It's, yeah. it's a good starting point. We're going to have more episodes on this weight loss series and this obesity series. A lot of other things to consider when it comes to uh, weight issues you might be having. Some things you probably have not even considered as, as being problematic and contributing to your um, weight issues and your inflammation. So please, um, be on the lookout for those they are going to be coming out. We'll be rolling them out one at a time, one each week might have some bonus ones in there because there's lots of topics that are coming to me that I feel like I just have to tell you about, you know? And, and the folks, the reason we're focusing on weight is because it's one of the easiest symptoms to identif- identify. As you always say, weight is a symptom of something. Usually some type of inflammation is it, but is you know, what's causing it? Is it food or stress or toxins? But the reason is we're not talking about vanity here. It just happens that weight's one of the first things that you notice about something that's not going right in your body. And it's a myth. There is no, I'm fat and fabulous. Well, that's because you're talking about you being comfortable with the way you appear, which is beautiful. I get that. Yeah. But you're not healthy. Right. So if you're fat. I don't care if your blood pressure is fine or those 16 labs came back normal on your annual wellness exam. If you're carrying extra weight, it's a sign your body's not functioning correctly, mm-hmm. okay? And there's lots of other things to consider. And you need to get serious about it because I'm going to tell you, it's a symptom. And if you don't address it, whatever's causing that inflammation and causing you to gain weight and, and not be able to lose it, it's go- it's causing other things too. Mm-hmm. Your joints, and, your, and your, you don't, everything. And you don't want to reach a point to where th- all the wheels fall off. And because it's very hard to get those wheels back on. You know, when we didn't talk about that you wanted to add was, uh, was the gastric bypass stuff. We're going to have a whole podcast Don't do it, episode folks. on the stomach surgeries that are being offered as the cure for your weight issues. Don't do them. It, remi- right? it reminds me of the Saturday Night Live with Steve Martin, the Theodoric from York. You know, everything he did was bloodletting. You know, you, whatever problem they had was bloodletting. Well, that seems to be the with these GI people. Oh, okay, well... The staple your stuff. Well, the GI doctors aren't doing those. The general surgeons are. But it just it's it's such bad medicine, and you got in trouble one time for a call. Yeah, it. I've I've yeah. Anyway, we'll talk more about that. I tend to I don't hold anything back. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a CEO or whatever. I'm gonna let you know what I think about it. There is no monopoly on brains. All right. I I I'm a doctor just like you are. I have an opinion just like you do. And I'm sorry if you don't like my opinion, but I'm not going to hold back. And that's why I have to work for myself now because I can't get a job anywhere she's, else. She's burnt she's some bridges. And I didn't mean to, but at some point I like to sleep good at night. We and I don't want to participate in a system that is not focused on health. 
and is focused only on money. It's hypocrisy. It is it, hypocrisy. Complicity, and if you're complicit with it. We didn't take the hypocrisy oath. We took the Hippocratic oath. I think most doctors have forgotten that or, think, don't, or don't understand. I, or they need to reread it. Yeah, they do. All right. That's a good place to end, don't you think? We yep. tried, we've tried to end twice now, but we um, always want to um, start talking about something else again. Anyway, we are legit ending it right now. Thanks for watching us. Follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, where else? Instagram. Those are all under Amy Beard MD. And visit our website. Take a look around. AmyBeardMD.com. See you. Bye. I don't take nothing that a doctor don't prescribe. I don't do no drugs, man. I don't do no drugs, man. I